welcome uh, to this uh, wonderful session. I'm so delighted and honoured to be chairing uh, on the transformation of much-loved books into films. Uh, the film um, has been made of tracks, this um, wonderful international bestseller um, coming out of the late 1970s of this extraordinary trek across the Western Desert from Central Australia, uh, 2,700 kilometres, if I'm right, um, by Robin with four camels and her beloved dog, uh, Dickety, to the west coast uh, of Australia. Um, it was, um, I think, really desired by many filmmakers, as we'll discuss in a moment, uh, to be made in a film, but it was finally made into one um, in 2013. And Ray, um, a very dear friend, I have to say, and uh, the author of a, a, a very cherished book, Romulus, My Father. And this is set not far from here in Barrencup, many of you will know and love the book, um, about his father, his complicated relationships with um, his uh, very troubled mother uh, who finally committed suicide, um, her lover Mitru, who also committed suicide. But a story which belies that really stark relaying of the facts, one full of luminous um, understanding of love, forgiveness and gratitude to the two men who raised you, particularly your father Romulus, but also uh, Hora, this wonderful friend he had, uh, and the kinds of values that um, you came to see as a child that they lived by. And this was, I think, also, you know, uh, there were numbers of filmmakers who wanted to make uh, a film of it, but um, you finally uh, relented when uh, Richard Roxburgh came along. So first I just wanted to ask both of you what you thought about the idea of your book being made into a movie. What was your reaction? Shall I go first? Well, it's had many uh, avatars, um, tracks the movie. Uh, it started pretty much as soon as the book was published. And I think the first person who, who offered me lots and lots of money was um, out of Africa, what's his name? Um, Sydney. Um, Sydney Pollack. Pollack. So he took me to lunch, and the first thing he said was, honey, you're not gonna like what I'm gonna do to your book. <laughs> And I thought that was so frank and um, nice. He was completely charming. Uh, but I had, I, I had this sense that it shouldn't ever be a Hollywood film. It should be made in Australia. It should be a small budget film. And I was, well, not small budget, but a small, an independent sort of film. Um, I was very concerned that the Aboriginal content be treated properly. So I said no, and I was very stupid because... <laughs> or very clever. Well, no, no stupid, because in the end it became Hollywoodized anyway and I couldn't protect it. Um, so the penultimate version was going to be Julia Roberts um, and lots and lots of budget. And I got sent these scripts that were so appalling, so embarrassing, so utterly, utterly terrible. Um, and luckily it didn't get up. Um, so by the time it was uh, taken up by Emil Sherman in Sydney, A, I thought they would never make it, and B, I thought, I have no control anyway, so it doesn't matter, let them just get on with it. Mm. Um, was it true that they were going to have Americans as playing Indigenous people, or was that...? Oh, in one... Well, not, not Emil. Uh, Emil sort of seduced me into trusting them, and I did, and I really, I have to say, I enjoyed the whole process of them being mm. involved in the film. But in one of the scripts, um, prior to that, when Julia was involved, there was a scene when Robin Davidson gets across the desert by being taught the dreaming by the Aboriginal people, and she is initiated into snake dreaming, and she follows the snake all the way to the west coast, and there's a scene where there are these Aboriginal men dancing around a fire carrying Julia, Robin, <laughs> smeared, in, you know, smeared in ashes and tom-toms going. I mean, just unspeakable. Um, so I'm very glad that one didn't happen. So um, before I ask Ray the same question, how, how did Emile 
seduce you into, or how did he overcome your resistance? Oh, I just liked him, and I liked the way he spoke about it. Um, and also, you know, once you get involved, it was sort of like a big Jewish family. It was great. Um, but I think the thing that finally <coughs> convinced me to to be somewhat involved in the process was when they got Mia um, to play me, and I had wanted her. I thought mm. she was absolutely the right person. So once that happened, I felt even more comfortable, and it was fine. Yes. Well, she's an absolutely wonderful actress. I remember when we first encountered her in, uh, in treatment, when mm. she was fabulous. playing an adult lesson. Absolutely she was very talkative. Absolutely yes. fabulous. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, she certainly uh, caught that um, extraordinary combination of, I thought, fragility, tenacity, mm. um, iron will, <laughs> but an incredible delicacy at the mm. same time. Um, yeah, which I think she was very good. And I think all, the whole team really, um, I mean, it's not the film I would have made, but that's not the point. They, I think all of them, the director, the actors, and Emil, tried their best to honour the spirit of the book. And I think that's all you can ask for as an, as an author, really. Yes. Mm. Ray, I know you were quite resistant for a time um, in having your uh, book made into a film. So tell us a little bit of how, what you felt about that and then yeah. how you overcame that. Well, the reasons didn't, didn't become clear to me for a, a long time. I mean, I had reasons. But there are all sorts of reasons that it wasn't one. And there was only, in fact, when I sat down to write after Romulus, uh, which was 14 years later. No, sorry, no, no, it was only six years after the film that it became a bit clearer to me. Uh, but I, I, I just, at first, just thought, oh, well, they'll, they'll make melodrama and kitsch out of a, you know, a, a story that's reasonably dramatic and has a lot of potential for being turned into melodrama. Uh, but I, I, that, there was that a, a general thing. But I, it was also the case that I, I, I feel very strongly that it's hard to portray madness uh, with, without degrading it in some in some obvious ways, or degrading it in in sentimental sympathy. Uh, and uh, so there are three mad people in this film, and mm. I thought if it's hard to get it with get it right with one, how are you going to get it right with three? So, mm. so that that was there. So, and my agent, uh, Marka Connolly, was even probably less keen than I was, and mm. she wouldn't even tell me. Sometimes she'd phone up about three, and so about three months ago, I won't say who they were, but so and so phoned, and I said, mm. "You make the film, and we'll tell you if we like it." That was her, her attitude. Mm. But one day she found me in London and said that this fellow Richard Roxburgh had, and I, I didn't know who he was. He said he, she, he was young, he described him as a young, young man, very, very popular in Sydney, which immediately put me against him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and he's been phoning and phoning, and uh, may I give him your phone number? And I thought, my God, there must be something there if you, she's gone this far. And so he phoned me and asked if you could come to London. And I said, no, I don't want you to come to London because if you do, it's a long way and I feel I owe you something if you come all that way. And he said, I'm coming nonetheless. And he came and he had two bottles of red wine, <laughs> really good red wine. <laughs> which is always persuasive. Do anything for us. And the other thing is I liked him immediately as a person. Mm. Uh, so all my prejudice just fell away. Mm. And I was very impressed by how much he loved the book. And he said to me, I, I don't want to be a director, I'm, I just want to direct this. And that I had told my sister as soon as I read it, I'm going to direct this book. So, mm. but anyway, so, so we talked and drank his wine and I said, I'm sorry Richard, you can't have it. And then he said, well, will you allow, allow me to write a screenplay? And then I really did think, God, it has to be mean to say no to such a modest request mm. as this. And then he couldn't do it. He tried for a year, and uh, then he said, oh, I, I said, good, it's all off, I didn't want to. He said, no, I've got the best screenwriter in the country to do I won't say who it was, I. And uh, it was just awful, what was produced. And <laughs> then he did a second version, and then he was angry with me, because he thought, who am I to reject this famous screenwriter? And I thought, good, it's all off. <laughs> 
And then Richard, ever enthusiastic, said, no, no, I, I have uh, this producer, John Maynard and Robert Connolly. And then he told me John Maynard had been involved with that film about the New Zealand writer, Angel at My, my Table, um, Janet Frame. Mm -hmm. And, yes. I, and uh, I thought that was a wonderful film. It was, yes. Yeah. And so I thought, oh, if they can do something like that, I'll go along with it. And so I agreed to do that, but we still couldn't get a screenwriter. And it was a long story. We were six years down the track, I still hadn't signed a contract. <laughs> so I still felt I had, you know, I felt I had complete control. I could say no at any time. But by that time, I had trusted uh, Richard absolutely. I mean, not to make a good film. I had no idea if he could make a film. He'd never made one before. But I trusted his integrity absolutely. And I trusted even, I'm sorry, not even more, but even more importantly, the integrity of the producers, because I know they could say no to anything the director does in the end if they want to. So that mattered a lot to me. And when they got Nick Drake, an English poet of European sensibility, which is, had been my criteria for the writer. So say that again, you, you actually set a criteria that you, it had to be someone with a European sensibility. Well, I mean, I was, that's, I, yeah, I said, I'd like a, first of all, I said, I'd like a poet. To a write poet. A poet, and then I'd, it'd be good if they understood what they were doing. So for that, you needed <laughs> some inwardness. You didn't have to be European, but had mm. some inwardness with the European sensibility, and not turn all that into a cliche, mm. which the most famous writer in Australia <laughs> had done twice over as a screenwriter. And was that important for you because you felt that the film couldn't have integrity unless the person understood your mother's sensibility and your father's? Yeah. 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 Because he'd come from Romania, she had come from Germany. Um, yeah, yeah, I know that they're, 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 they're different, but um, Czech's not a bad place to be in between to the Czech Republic. But so um, when he came out to Australia, um, and he visited, I believe, at Chelva, yeah. um, the place you have now at Barringham, very close to where you grew up um, in Frogmore. And what was his reaction to the landscape? Uh, he liked the landscape because Chelva is at a very beautiful spot. We've got hilly granite country on one side and the plains on, on the other side. Uh, but I mean, I took him to where on to the plains where the house had stood where I grew, I grew up. And it, it had burnt, burnt down in a grass fire many years before, and it was just, and it was a, a sort of um, very, uh, one of those gray, sultry, oppressive s summer days. It was the 25th of February, I remember. And uh, the place, uh, and every, uh, scotch thistles, dry scotch thistles just covered everything. And I could see his, how crestfallen he was because he'd had his sense that this was a beautiful landscape as I had tried to describe it. And uh, then I, I, I just knew he had to see it in, in a different, well, in, literally in two senses, I'm sorry, in two senses, in a different light. So I took him again that, that, that uh, late afternoon and early in the morning and he fell in love with her. And, but he said afterwards, that he was glad of the first time because it gave him a sense of how my mother must have yes. responded yes. to that country. Mm. Yes, that was something I was really struck by in both the books and the film, that the landscape looms as if another character. Mm. And so right. every person is interacting not only with each other or with animals, which are um, a really delightful aspect of both, books and, and the film we'll come to in a moment, but with this landscape, and it struck me as also being uh, both a common factor in, in both films, but rather different. So, um, see if I get this right. In, in your case, Ray, I was really struck by the forbidding harshness of the landscape in one particular scene, which was when your mother arrives with a little suitcase and she's in a um, a quite delicate kind of dress uh, and she's dropped off by a taxi and suddenly you see this um, vibrant, spirited, but very fragile um, 
uh, woman in this extremely harsh, and you see it through her eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, that, that that was brilliantly done by Richard actually, because probably only two, li literally two minutes before you, you had to, I never know whether to say Ray or the boy, but anyway, <laughs> Richard know. always referred, when it doesn't matter, but or at Ray, riding his bike down the track, you know, full of joy. Mm, mm, and two right. minutes later, Christina looking up the track, utterly desolate, wondering how the hell did I ever end up here? Mm. And then, with a determined, but a kind of despairing look, walks, walks mm. slowly up the track mm. in high heel shoes. Yes. yes, well, I thought that was one of the strengths of the film, uh, that you could see that same landscape through different eyes. Um, and you do see the joyousness of the boy. And often you see, even where she's despairingly um, uh, at, a, uh, at a tree, um, but uh, the, the little boy, Ray, uh, played wonderfully by um, Cody Smith uh, McPhee. McPhee. Just, um, I thought perhaps um, that was one of the ways that your anxieties about the film might have been overcome and that I, I thought his performance as the little boy was quite miraculous. I think it is. I, 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 it astonished me when I actually saw the film. I, I had read out over every draft of the screenplay, but I tended to read it as a play and so on. That, that was one thing that got in the way of, of my really imagining how it would be. And when I actually saw the film, I, I was shocked that you know, I was at, in 95% of the scenes because I should have known that it was there on the page, but it was still a, still a, still a shock. And I, I felt Cody miraculously or really uncannily captured exactly how I felt. Mm -hmm. um, and I he uh, is 10 years old at the time, you know. But, he, but he, he was, in one sense, deeply embedded in the part because at a wrap-up party at, at the end, because I hadn't seen him at all. I'm sorry, I had seen him, but I, anonymously I went to his 10th birthday party, mm. but I didn't say who I was. But when, at the wrap-up party, he put his arms around my, my waist when he was introduced and cried and said that he'd lived my life for four months. And, and wasn't able to, to leave. He held on to me mm. for a full hour in the middle of this party. So he, in one sense, he was yeah. most deeply. But, but he also, but the, you know, uh, uh, Nick Drake told the story at one stage that he was, Cody said, what am I supposed to feel like here? Am I supposed to be sad? Am I supposed to be happy? Am I supposed to be this, you know? And, and then he would then you know, go after a, what looked for an audience is a traumatic scene where Romulus uh, sort of uh, beats me after I'd lied about what I'd done with his razor. Cody goes off and giggles and plays some game. Yes. It's amazing what, how mm. this can happen. Yes, no, he, he seemed to utterly um, inhabit your spirit as a boy. I want to come back to that in a moment, but Robin, um, Back to this question of landscape, and I was really interested that that, I, I felt that that was not the same at all with your encounter with the landscape. So that here's this, you know, astonishing um, desert, and it's, there's no doubt that there was someone who said to you, you know, you don't have to be unlucky to die out there. Yeah. And yet you didn't seem to see it as hostile. No, I never did. And the longer you went on, the more, and it wasn't just the dust on you, mm. the more you seemed to meld into uh, the In environment. The film. Yeah. Yes. Um, and the more you seemed a part of it. And it was actually the, the social world um, which seemed more impinging and mm. difficult. And mm. Well, I think that's absolutely correct. Um, I mean, we, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, how we conflate what actually happened with tracks the book with the film it all starts to get a bit blurry um, <clears throat> I think in the film uh, it, it's a very difficult book to make into a film because there's one character and there's not a lot of dialogue um, 
so I think they had to make her Mia Robin sort of more, um, certainly merging into the desert, but struggling. It was, you know, in the film, it looked very hard. In real life, I felt more and more comfortable as the journey went on. Um, and more and more, um, in a funny sort of way, at home in that desert. But therefore, because I was at home in that desert, therefore alienated from what had come before and mm. what was about to come after. Now, I think that's a very difficult thing to portray in a film. So the way they did it visually was to cover her in, you know, sunburn and to see her sort of spacing out. But of course, it wasn't actually like that. It was, mm. in a sense, it was the opposite to that. So it's one of those difficulties of translating, um, you know, these three translations. What actually happened into a book, that's one set of problems. Translating what happens in a book into a film is another set of problems. You have to solve a whole different set of problems. Um, so the landscape, and all, interestingly, the landscape, they shot it in uh, South Australia, in cattle country. So to me, it was a rather scrubby, uninteresting landscape in the, in the film, whereas the country I traveled through was really pure desert. Mm. Um, and very various. Extremely varied. Mm. And yet people say, my God, the landscape in that film, what a fabulous country. Um, I say, if you only knew. Um, so, yes, but I, I do like their attempt to make that landscape a, a character in the film. Mm, mm. Well, they had to, I guess they mm. had no choice. Mm. And partly like um, Cody, Mia, was so wonderful at inhabiting um, your spirit. So she is able, just as an actress, to, you know, because in the, in the book... Actors are incredible people. I don't know how well good actors are. I yes. mean, there's a lot of not so good actors out there, but... You know, and she was able to, I thought, to give a sense of an interior journey. Yes. Which is very hard to do. So well, that's the, why I wanted her, because I think she's one of those actors who's... She underacts, if anything, but her internal life is so present on the screen, mm, mm. and that's what the script required, really, yes. to have to some, someone who has that internal life going on. Mm. Yes, there's a, a scene in the um, film where she's loading up the camels um, time and again, you know, and at a certain point she says um, to the photographer from National Geographic mm, who yeah. comes out and he's, he's, she says, all I'm doing is, you know, loading and unloading <laughs> and, and, and putting one foot in front of another and those mm. marvellous um, mm. sandals you're wearing. And, mm. you know, not a lot else was happening. But in fact, you could see both in the film and, and certainly um, mm. that's one of the really marvellous things about the book is this mm. interior mm. transformation mm. that goes on. Mm. Now, I was wondering, if you could explain to us um, something I read that you'd said somewhere with that, that journey was formative, mm -hmm. but also that you felt your consciousness by being alone there for so long mm. had kind of rewired you in some mm. way. Mm. Yes, I think probably literally. Mm. Um, yes, it did. Uh, it took a long time on the journey to get rid of um, a sort of you know, I'll use this term wiring, it's a terrible shorthand, but you know what I mean, um, to get rid of that previous wiring, which was wiring that was required for an urban, essentially urban life and um, mm. a particular way of thinking. But when you're on your own in that intense sort of way, and I think walking has a lot to do with it also, mm. and this vastness around you all the time and being totally dependent on you acting correctly in this landscape, or you're dead. Mm. Yes. It's like that. Um, that you, inevitably, your consciousness changes. It just does. Mm. So, uh, and the irony of, of it was that the more alone I was and the more isolated and remote I was, the more that I felt completely connected to everything. 
It was the antithesis of being lonely. Yes. Um, <clears throat> but then, of course, coming into culture again was very difficult. And I simply could not remember why I would need to cover my breasts or, like, literally, I was sort of thinking, do, do I need to do that? Is, it, is that the wrong or right thing? Mm. So all of those mm. um, ways of being that we take for granted had really fallen away. And if it took eight months to go into the desert and sort of be at home there, I think I still haven't quite come back. <laughs> uh, probably, thank goodness for that. Maybe. Yeah. Because, um, oh, I just followed that up with, I was in New York two weeks after the trip, and I, it was very clear to me that, you know, mm. we were all completely deranged. We were all <laughs> <in the bed. laughs> no, well, I, I felt um, th that was really s uh, striking in that, um, we, we normally think of someone, uh, we, we would describe them as kind of going loco or they, mm. you know, mm. the tropo or they, mm. you know, there's some disparaging way of saying yes. that they've gone out they've, to the, yep. um, but in fact, you kind of went sane out there yep. and then you confronted. Now I've had to go mad again yeah. and it's taking a really long time. <laughs> so, so with the, um, you know, when you're out there alone, mm. you're actually not alone because you're, with um, these beloved animals. And one of the revelations oh, too, yeah. for me was yeah. that um, dogs, or I, I understand, horses I understand, many different animals, yeah. but camels, I had no idea they were so uh, fierce, for one, mm -hmm. but also so charismatic. That, that's a very good word, they are charismatic. Extremely personable, they are. Look, I don't know if it's true with all camels, um, but certainly mine were idiosyncratic and very, very funny and witty, um, just very clever, wonderful beings, really. And of course, you know, because I was in that situation and we were mutually dependent, we were all dependent on each other, then of mm, course that's mm. a, a very deep bond. But it's left me with a, a real interest in this cross-species communication. It just mm. seems to me very peculiar that a camel and a human being can communicate. And um, how does that happen, really? We're on such different bandwidths. So I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in how these con different consciousnesses make sense of one another. Yes. Mm. And they clearly were very attached to you in a way, too. Yes. They were, and I, th I guess they saw me as some sort of other camel. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, well, you were the leader of their herd, really. Yes, I guess. Oddly walking on two legs rather than four. But, oh. didn't, maybe I do look a bit like... Anyway, <laughs> but I, um, I went back to see them, must have been a decade later, and they'd been wild for all that time. Um, and they were in a huge holding paddock about 10 miles square, and I went out and I called them, and, you know, Heard, and I had all their treats, you know, the licorice and the watermelon and all the things they love. So I spent about an hour with them, no ropes, no nose lines, nothing. And they remembered all the commands. This is 10 years later, and I'd whoosh, and they'd sit down. And really, it was extraordinary. So that was great, and it was time to leave them again, and uh, I had to walk back to the homestead. And they fell in line behind me and followed me all the way back to the homestead. Oh. Uh, yeah. no, they're remarkable animals, really. Mm. There are wonderful uh, passages in T. Lawrence's um, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Seven Pillars about, of Wisdom, about that's about right. About the, yeah, mm. They are amazing. And, um, but don't, aren't you interested in how these, yes. this species interaction, what the hell is going yeah. on there? Yeah. Well, we have to remember that, Ray, you had um, a, um, a bird that used to make love to your father every morning. <laughs> He would say, I love you, Jack, <laughs> the cockatoo used to say. Uh, yeah. There's a certain way they kiss, apparently. Yeah, well, we, we, uh, the, this, this cockatoo, whose name, name was Jack, my, my father refused to cage him. Mm. And uh, so he flew free everywhere. And uh, he slipped on our kitchen, kitchen door. And we just put some paper <laughs> underneath to, uh, you know, for, the, for him to shit on. And, uh, you know, it's a very destructive bird. He, 
ate the door. Ate a hole in the wall. <laughs> the, the door was like, like that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, and my, and my father and I slept in the same bedroom, and there was a, 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 a door that was just you, you could just push it didn't have, have you know, handles and all that. And every morning you could hear Jack coming down off the door, and then there was a, there was lino, and you could hear his feet pat 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 on the lino, and with his head he'd push the door, and he, he could never get it open in just one go. So. He'd push and he'd pat, pat, pat his hands with truth. Push, pat, pat, pat his hands Push and so on. And, th and then he, he'd eventually get in and he would um, climb up to my father's the bedstead and uh, just sit, sit there until he saw my father's eyes open. Uh, and I, I think my father kept his eyes closed for some time long, <laughs> longer. No, he, he was actually asleep. But anyway, eventually. So Jack would just jump in under the blankets and from under the blankets put, put his head up and, and, and his beak to my father's lips and go <laughs> like that. And so it was kissing. And my, my father could, uh, you, you, he could just pat this like a cat. So you mm. just roll him over and mm. over. It was just extraordinary. But mm. it, it wasn't sort of, you know, on your arm type relationship. Mm. There's also a, an aspect of animals, as it comes back to your, the, the cross species um, kind of consciousness mm. being connected to mm. each other. There are things that animals know that we don't. Yes, indeed, of course. So, um, things that, they see that we don't, yeah. yeah and I, I was very yeah. interested in the way you um, wrote about it, and then I, I think Mia depicts this really effectively. There's the, you had to be more and more observant, and you had to, in a way, relate to your environment like an animal, like a human animal, in that yes, you had to survive. Mm -hmm. And you ha if you didn't observe enough about, you know, waking up at 4 a.m. to hear the bells yes, of the yes, camels, if yes. you didn't know what the tracks were, That's right. you could be mm -hmm. done for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we are human animals, we kind of forget how, this is a lovely word of raise, creatureliness, we, mm -hmm. we forget that, but mm -hmm. we are. Yes, indeed. Uh, and so they were observing things that you might not be. That's you were right. observing things that they might not That's be. That's right. But also this beloved dog, mm. Diggity. Mm. I wept the first time I read mm. The Death of Diggity. I many wept heart, this, this the second time. And I, yeah. I think it's one of the most moving depictions of a relationship between mm. um, a human and an animal anywhere mm. in, in literature. Oh, but you. just say a little bit about Diggity and what she... Because she really saved your life on occasion. Yes. Um, well, it's interesting what you said, that there you've got these three different species as a group, mm. and we're all perceiving slightly different things. Um, yes, yeah, quite interesting, that. And of course, Diggity, you know, I could see if I, at night I would, uh, when I'd stopped for the evening, I'd go out exploring or I'd go out for wood and so on, and at one point I sort of got disoriented and I just told her to go home. And she didn't get it at first and she thought I was punishing her. And I said, no, you go home. And, and you could see this light bulb go on over her head. And she thought, oh yeah. <laughs> and so off she went and she'd look behind and make sure that I was following and um, she really got it. Um, so it's a, I just find that whole thing really, really interesting because I don't think anyone's quite understood how those um, connections happen between different species. I really don't. No, I, don't, I think you're right, but mm. I think it's a very deep thing. I mm. think what, one of the other things that um, w was really sort of fully present mm. um, in... Uh, your book, the film, but also in your work, Ray, is ways of relating to other human beings that um, turns on its head all our normal social assumptions. Mm. So you were talking before about the cockatoo that chewed a great hole in the door and you put some newspaper down to collect the cockatoo shit. There was a way in which you lived and the way in which you lived in that camp, mm. um, you know, each, each campsite mm. and with sleeping with Dickety and mm. Occasionally, apparently, uh, um, you'd wake up with a camel head in your yes. pack. Um, yeah. But it's, it's a way of stepping outside the cultural and the social, um, but particularly away from that 
uh, kind of um, paranoid, competitive, uh, very uh, kind of elbows out mm. way that you would have hit, for example, when you got to New York mm. or the way mm. many of us just live our, mm. our lives. Mm. So that there's this um, a, a stepping out of the world in a way, or out of the social world, out of the social that's, world. that's true of, of, of both um, the way uh, you're able to see it. Mm. But in another way, you're able, because of that, um, to not live according to the conventional ways of seeing things of, of mm. you know, your time. And one of the things which is an extremely strong kind of theme in both of you is, I think, to use your phrase, Ray, the common humanity um, that's in all of us. Yeah. Um, but it was particularly evident in, in, for example, relating to Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And I, that's obviously been a huge part of your work too, Ray. But um, it struck me that they're, they're really deeply connected to, to set aside human hierarchy and just uh, to try and relate one human heart yes, to, to another. another. Um, and so tell us a bit about Mr Eddie and how he helped you shed some of the burdens that you walked into the desert with. Well, I was incredibly privileged. I mean, that was such a stroke of luck. And it's unprecedented. Um, very unusual for an old Aboriginal bloke to just decide that he'd walk with a, a kunkah across a, you know, I mean, just really unusual. He was an unusual man within his own community, and he did this unusual thing. Um, so that was my great good luck. <clears throat> I think he didn't speak any English. I spoke very, very rudimentary Pitinjara. And I think the way he, so up until that point, I think in the journey, and he sort of met me maybe halfway through, uh, I hadn't yet got rid of the obsession with time. I had a clock. I mean, I'd put had an the alarm clock. I had an alarm clock. <laughs> And I'd put this bloody alarm clock on in the morning, um, and if I didn't get out of the swag, I'd feel guilty. Really, really mad. Um, so being with him and having to adjust to his time or lack of time, and realizing my own frustration with his lack of time and how absurd that was in that context, um, he helped me just get rid of it. Um, and also, I think, watching him being in that landscape and being of that landscape and being so utterly integrated, so completely uh, just totally in it. And we were going through his dreaming. We were sort of following his dreaming. Um, and this old fellow, you know, we'd be walking along and picking a bit of bush tucker and suddenly he'd just burst, he'd go into song and he'd start singing his landscape. It was a very wonderful, moving thing and yet sort of ordinary. So I think when he left, I felt very confident of A, my skills um, and, and B, I seemed to have got rid of that anxiety about time and um, performance. Um, so I got rid of the clock, and from then on, the next few months was when I really felt that I'd come home to that landscape. And I'm sure Eddie had a great deal to do with that. And the interesting thing now, when I go back to visit that mob, is that they've got a story of the camel lady as well, only they call me Desert Woman, which I think is a step up. <laughs> um, so it's quite nice to get their view of, mm. of the Camel Lady story as well. Yeah, Desert Woman is definitely <laughs> it's a lot nicer I think I'll than go Camel with Lady. That. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'd wonder whether you sometimes now have, you know, you're in a social situation, mm. perhaps you're having a high tea in England in a mm. garden somewhere, I'm mm. imagining you, and a sort of snake crawls across and people suddenly look to you mm. to deal with it because you're the camel lady. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, ha doesn't happen a lot in England, but... <laughs> but, yes. Well, I'm, well it's in, you know, I, I'm more the camel lady in Australia. Okay. In England, not so much, because 30 years of my life was in London. Mm. And in India, no one knows about the camel lady in India, let me tell you. So there are these quite discreet 
parts of my mm. internal life. Um, so I have to sort of go back, I have to sort of leap over my previous um, 30 years to get to the camel ship and the camel lady, so she does feel very remote. Mm. And Ray, um, I was thinking about yeah, your, uh, your father, the way he saw the world and how nourished you were by that despite this um, incredible tragedy unfolding as well around you. Um, and the way you saw the world in the light of your father's friendship with horror and how that gave you a way of seeing that also um, allowed you to um, ha have a, 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 an understanding of what it is to really grant an equality of respect um, to Indigenous people. And I think that, that the way of sort of explaining how what you learned in childhood is probably by the story of Vacek and how they treated him. Yeah, well, I've, I've always felt... Um, I, was at, I was at a conference in Berlin not long ago and someone gave a paper in, in which he was asking whether some acts are unforgivable. And, mm. and I thought, well, I don't know how you'd ever work that out. I mean, you, you could describe the most awful act. But whether you felt that someone could, with, without sentimentality and authentically, forgive is something you have to wait and mm. see. And, uh, so I've always felt in, in, in all my philosophy that, it, that in the end, that you, we, we see things deeply through the way people live them, the way things deepen a person's life. So it's, that's all. And, and I, 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 I suspect I've come to see that, because, or feel that way, or think that way because of my, my childhood with, with my, my father. Uh, and the, the person in question, Vatsik, was uh, had come with them in, in 1950 on these assisted passages uh, and was sent to work on Kenkaran Reservoir, which is about 40 minutes drive from here between Miriborough and Malden. And uh, Vatsek lost his mind within a year or two of coming. And he went to live on, uh, on the slopes of a, a small mountain called Mount Tarangawa between a couple of boulders and, and had put bits of tin on the boulders. And he, in fact, built a shed nearby. I never knew why he didn't live in the shed, but I suspect it was because the boulders were warmer than the, the tin shed. But in the tin shed, he kept things that he, his food he'd made and pickled, mostly in his urine. And he, he was visibly mad. He talked to himself and he offered you food that had been cooked in his urine. Uh, in, in the film, actually, there's a scene where he cooks eggs. In his oh, urine yes, first. that's right. <laughs> and and some, Richard said, someone said, oh, my God. And Richard said, it could have been worse. They might have been poached. <laughs> 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 But what, and I don't, I don't think I fully realised that this, the, how wondrous my father's attitude and towards him, and also Hora's attitude towards him was, until I reflected on a response I'd made to a couple of journalists when, just before the book was published, and we, <coughs> there was going to be a, a big piece in the Age about it, and I took them to where about six boulders had been, and one of them said to me was asked me, did Vatsek appear weird to you when you were a kid? And I said, no. And afterwards mm. I thought, why did I say no without even thinking? Mm. Because he was weird. And it wasn't because he, uh, it wasn't because he was good to me. He was, he was always very, very kind. Mm. And I always knew him to be a very kind-hearted man. We had a dog called Olof, and, and you know, Vatsek had very little money, and once he bought some sausages, in, in Maryborough and it was uh, left them out and Orloff ate them. And Vatsik came to Orloff and said, Orloff, how could you do this? <laughs> and Phil, you know, there are only my only sausages and so on. And he said to my father afterwards, or to Hora, I can't remember which, he said that Orloff looked, gave him a very clear look <laughs> as though it was a promise he would never do it again. <laughs> 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 and he was that, such a good hearted. Out of person, he 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 he, uh, he once looked over a whole field of Scotch thistles and wondered what you could do what what you could do with them in a factory. And the reason he was thinking of factories was not to make money; 
He wanted to build a factory and to produce things in the factory that would pay workers decent, humane wages. That, mm. that was mm. his home. So I knew he was a very, very good man, but that wouldn't have, have made the difference. And I, 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 I realised when I reflected on this question, it was because neither my father nor Hora ever showed towards him the slightest trace of condescension. condescension. Mm. Uh, uh, which, which I think is, is, is a very, very rare quality. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and I sort of, um, I just grew up instinctively with, mm. with, with that sense. And, and it, I think my, both my father and Hora were enabled to, to do, it, it wasn't my, I really want to emphasize it wasn't because I had any virtues that I was, as I was towards him. It was just because I saw him That's in the it. light of yeah. their behavior towards him. Yeah. That, that was it. Just, yeah. just, you know, just like you behave. Yeah towards animals because you were the way you see people treat them and think, mm -hmm. things like that. So, uh, so that, that, that became, became very important in, in my, my, my whole thinking. life. But I think mm -hmm. they were enabled to do it in part because as I say, I think in Romulus that, that I've never known people who had such a fierce disdain for you know, external signs of status and prestige and mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. putting on ears and so on. It mm -hmm. was really, really fierce in them. Mm. Well, I thought that was something deep in both of you, uh, in yes. both your ways of mm. seeing the world. And I think what people fell in love with in the books was, and felt nourished by, you know, mm. that I feel, I, 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 there's a quote by the um, environmentalist Clive Hamilton where he said something along the lines that people work long hours at jobs they don't like, to buy things to impress people they don't like. Um, and so there's this, you know, there's a sense of the rat race and the treadmill and so on. But I thought that in the uh, uh, extraordinary response to both um, books and also to the films that there is a yearning and hunger in people for something different where, you know, as we were saying earlier, this way of relating to someone without mm. that hierarchical mm. way, you know, without status um, mm. and this, you know, one um, human heart to another. Yes, I think that's probably true. Of, yes, I think that's true. <laughs> but I don't know where that comes from necessarily. I suppose similarly to Ray, it's a, an atmosphere that you absorb when you're a child, I guess. I'm not, I'm really so not interested in status. It's, certainly, it's yeah. certainly never a matter of moral principle or... No, exactly, and, and it's, it's just... It, it's not in the ordinary sense of virtue either. It, mm. that, that's why I'm so mm. one who emphasises it's a matter of mm. how you're able to see, to see the world. Mm. So certain things mm. just mm. are perfectly natural mm. or obvious. Exactly, or, or, yeah. yeah. Well, at this point, um, we have uh, a little time for questions. So it might be a good point to, uh, uh, for people if they want to think of a question to ask. What the process of marking a book to a potential produce and how do you sell the why of your work to a producer? The process of making a, um, from the book to the film, is that what you're saying and how you... To, to produce. Yeah, to be produced, how do you, what's the process of transformation? Well, I, in my case, I had very little to do with it except, except to um, discuss the screenplay with the, the, the writer, and I, I was not involved in anything else whatsoever. Um, Were you involved with the production uh, of the film? Well, um, I eventually had an agent who took care of that when it became obvious that I wasn't going to have control over any film that was made. I just asked an agent to act in my best interest. And <clears throat> then I would never have been involved in any of the scripts that I'd received over the years. Um, but when Emil sent me scripts um, and the direct, you know, I'd get these frantic calls from New York from John Curran in the middle of the night saying, what do you think about this and what do you think about that? And I'd tell him, and then they'd take no notice whatsoever. <laughs> so, so I was sort of both involved and not involved. Mm. Um, one thing I was going to um, just uh, relating to that, but both films really have do have a shift 
from the perspective of the writer in the book, I think. And in your case, um, it is that they give an explanation. Yes, uh, it's the one thing I was a bit, not cross yes. about, but I, I disagree They link with. it to your mother's suicide yes, and yes, yes. Um, to your childhood, even the, to your yes. love of Diggity is linked to your love of Goldie yes. and so on. No, no. So you were cross with that? Well, I wasn't cross with it, but, I, and I could see why he would feel that it was necessary to give some sort of reason for why this girl decides to do this thing. I just don't think life is like that. Um, I do not think I crossed the desert because my mother killed herself. I just don't think that's true. Um, and it certainly had nothing to do with the dog I owned when I was a kid. So, you know, but there, as I said before, there are problems you have to solve in writing a film script that are very different to the problems you have to solve in writing a book. Mm. So in the end, not that I could have changed it anyway, but in the end I said, oh, well, do what you feel you need to do. But I am personally uncomfortable with those scenes in the film mm. because I don't think they're relevant, really. Mm. And, and I would add to that that when you put forward the idea that this girl is doing this extraordinary thing because her mother hanged herself, you're also saying that for anyone, particularly a woman, to do something out of the ordinary or unconventional or, you know, apparently difficult, there has to be something a little bit wrong with them or they have to be working something out or... Escaping you know, you, something. Yes, or. you can't just do it because it's a bloody good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh. Can I just say one, one other important thing I found out is how, how extraordinary actors, how extraordinarily they can understand things without, even though they might articulate mm. the thing utterly banally. Yeah. I was really worried uh, about a scene uh, in Romulus, my father, where um, my mother has a, a, a child with her lover and there's a scene in which Romulus comes to the, to the house. To the house and yeah. The lover, his name is Mitchell, has, this ba has the baby in his arms and he says at one point to Romulus, would you like to hold her? And Romulus takes her and, and says, I think she's very beautiful, just like her mother. And I thought this could be played in a really awful 1970s way, you know, where we're all have to be rational, we all have to do etc. And I thought I'd talk to Franca Patenta about this. So we, I, I discussed the scene with Frank Red Molden, actually. I was, uh, and she said, yeah, just like hippies they were. And I said, oh my God. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's the exact opposite of what I wanted yes. to say. Anyway, and so I, was, I went away very anxious about this. But she plays it beautifully. Mm -hmm. So it's just intuiting That's it. Just, mm -hmm. they're just... But that's talent, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Often actors aren't able to articulate what they're mm. doing, but that, that magic thing happens and they just seem to mm. absorb a character and present that character. They're wonderful. Creatures. Yes, I was struck by how Cody intuited your... Um, I, I have to preface this by saying um, my husband is a very old friend of Ray's um, and when um, I married Rob, he wanted to introduce me to this very deep and important friend. And he described a number of things, your philosophy and how original and remarkable it was and um, how intelligent you were and so on and how he climbed mountains and I thought, okay. And then he said, and he's sort of a bit of a rocker. He really loves Elvis Presley. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> and that bit I really found um, rather startling. All the rest was, was interesting, but, but um, not um, so startling. And then Cody actually is able to enact a kind of incipient sexual vivacity, I'll say. You know, he, he, he dances, he, he's a child, but there's a kind of um, vibrancy and a... Um, yeah, I know, but they, they have him. You know, I, no, nobody knows why they put these dates in the film. It was 1962 and they have him <laughs> discovering rock and roll in 62. And I said to Richard, for God's sake, I may have been a country boy, I wasn't that back, but you know, <laughs> that it took me to 1962 to discover. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any other questions from our audience? Yes? Robin, a question for you. Yeah. Um, uh, some years after your very personal journey 
where you were separated from society. You were in India and you traveled with some people who also have a very close relationship with camels. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking when I read that uh, of what the late uh, writer Bruce Chatwin mm -hmm. said about herds people. And about? About herds people, people who herd animals. Yes. Right? Uh, as a societal gathering. Now, you've lived in very many different societies. You commented in New York, England. And Chatwin said that he thought that because of many, many years, thousands of years of people living in close relationship with camel, that that was a more appropriate society than the ones that we experience now. Uh, how did you, did you feel that, any of that when you were with those people in India? Well, I'm very interested in nomadism generally. In fact, Bruce was a, an old mate of mine and we talked about this quite a lot. I mean, it's a complicated issue, obviously. But it seems to me that <clears throat> uh, the sedentary life is a very recent phenomenon, um, 10, 12,000 years. Um, the people that I went on migration with in India represented to me all the sort of humanist values that you would want to see operating in a society. And I think that is because they were mobile. That is, they had to deal with difference. They were very cosmopolitan. They were constantly having to deal with different kinds of people. Um, they had to understand their environment or they'd be, you know, they had to depend on that environment. <clears throat> they were good at negotiating with different sorts of people and they were very um, egalitarian amongst each other. So I think there is something about, um, there are these values that are associated with the nomadic life that we risk losing, or uh, if not losing, um, having, we sort of, we give them up for other values that may not be in our long-term interests. I suppose that's what I think. But of course, it's a very complicated issue, and I don't want to romanticize nomadic cultures. I don't want to romanticize the past. Um, but as we lose these forms uh, uh, forms, uh, social forms that were dependent upon the nomadic life. And let's face it, the one thing about being nomadic is that you can't carry too much gear. You can't accumulate stuff. Um, and I think the values that are associated with that kind of life are very high values. Mm -hmm. And as uh, the, the nomadic life is being eradicated in, contemporary, in the contemporary world, we risk losing not just those values, but the idea of um, the idea of leaving a light footprint on this earth. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any more questions? One more. Time for one more. Yes. Um, uh, uh, this is a question to both of you, and you've you've touched on it a little bit, but I'm interested in the process of how the the lead actors portraying yourselves, whether they the, at any stage just re relied through the director and the, and the script writer just on your text and the translation from text into script, or whether they actually communicated with you through the director. Well, in my, ca in, in my case, I, I knew uh, I, I, I knew Richard well by that stage. I, 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 Nick Drake and I became very, very close friends. Uh, so the screenwriter. I, yeah, he's the screen screen screenwriter. So I'm sure that that had a, had had a lot to do do with it. And then I think Cody is just a miraculous actor. Yeah. Yeah. Those, are, those, are those three things. Yeah. Uh, in my case, uh, I met Mia. <coughs> I, li I liked Mia as an actor. I'd seen her in, in treatment and I thought she was just really astonishing. She's got the business. 
Um, and then I met her a week before they began the shoot. Um, I took her out bush to teach her a bit of camel business. And we're both extremely introverted, shy people. So she's on one side of the plane looking out the window, sort of all buttoned up like this, and I'm on the other side of the plane. <laughs> and, um, but somehow from that week, she absorbed something from me. I don't know what or how, um, because I don't think it was necessarily in the script. Um, and then the next time I saw her, I'd gone out to one of the locations and I saw this kid coming across a dune leading camels wearing my clothes. <laughs> and I burst into tears. It was the most extraordinary thing. Um, but she really had sort of become me. And we're still very close. She's like a daughter or a niece or something. It's a very strange thing. Yeah. 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 We well, forget. I know Ray wants to make a little announcement. I just also should say that this was brought to you uh, by the La Trobe University um, Ideas of Society program, um, which I omitted at the beginning. Yeah. I have a little announcement. Some, some of you may know that I'm involved with the community uh, near, in Barringhart uh, fighting uh, a proposed chicken factory of, uh, on the Malort Plains, where I grew up and where the film was made. Uh, it's uh, a massive complex, 24 sheds, each is the length of the MCG, 8 million chickens so processed a year. Uh, it's very cruel, it's, yeah. it's, a, a, it's a complete blot on, on the landscape. And in one way or another we have to find $300,000 uh, to, to pay VCAT, to pay legal fees to fight it to VCAT. Uh, and uh, so I've been involved in a number of fundraising efforts and uh, recently uh, a young woman, Yana Cantaloupe, who's waving there, uh, has devised the idea uh, of, ha of forming a writer's prize, uh, which is uh, writing from plates. That's basically the, the theme of it. Uh, and uh, the money that will come from entry fees, which is very small, uh, $10 for the youth prize, $20 for the open prize, will all go to fight this, uh, this uh, monster proposal. Uh, and, uh, and Yana has come up with the idea of calling it the Not Jack Prize, and in it there's a little picture of Jack the Copper too. And she has a stall uh, as you go into the hub uh, it's, it's on your left in a little corner, sort of adjacent to the signing table. So I, I thought I would alert you to that. And I, 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 I all to say <laughs> that, that we have to, both these fine women are connected with the prize. Well, thank you for being a wonderfully um, alert and uh, attentive audience to two wonderful writers. And I really urge you, if you haven't yet seen the films as well, to go along and do so. Um, yeah, they're really marvellous creations. Thank you. Thank you, Anne.